Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to GW Center for Integrative Medicine Zoomcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Kogan, Medical Director of Center for Integrative Medicine and Associate Professor of Medicine at George Washington University. Uh, thanks for MedPage again for a wonderful quick review on comparison of two different ways of ketamine can be administered for depression. Uh, just for a quick review, in case you, most of you probably, I'm sure, heard of the, about this. This has been everywhere in the news, and uh, ketamine has been approved for depression by US FDA some, some time ago. Uh, and this is uh, a specific form, what's called S ketamine, and it's uh, administered nasally as a spray uh, based on the several studies that have showed benefits. So uh, but in reality, before that, for a long time, the ketamine has been administered in clinics like ours and many others across the country as either an infusion or an injection. An infusion would be intravenous, an injection would be intramuscularly, uh, sometimes subcutaneously, but mostly either IV or IM or intramuscularly. And so this question has been around, uh, what is better, doing it as an FDA-approved spray under the nose, under the guidance of psychiatrists, in the office or doing it with the guidance of a, a psychiatrist or, or, or a, 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 an effective therapist, a psychotherapist or some other trained professional um, as an injection. And you know the, the benefits, of course, when FDA approves a drug, you, you, you think that it's a, it's a good thing, right? Um, the thing is that uh, ketamine as an injection, of course, been improved as an anesthetic drug for uh, dozens, actually probably close to hundred years by now. And it's been used in pediatric populations safely, and it's been used for not just depression uh, in clinics like ours in integrated medicine clinics, but also for lots of other conditions like Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, and, and all kinds of things. Um, if the ketamine itself is extremely cheap drug. If uh, you wanna know the cost of self-dose in our clinic, it's about a quarter, uh, 25 cents. But the dose of ketamine nasally is about $800. Uh, and yes, insurances theoretically can pay. I understand that depending on how this gets processed, some insurances are indeed paying for this treatment. Uh, but you understand that uh, the actual generic cost of ketamine versus S ketamine is, is uh, of course, patented as a nasal sp spray and build at the exuberant amount, even though the actual self cost is so low. So yes, we know it's effective, but now how do they compare? So I find that the, I'm going to share my screen as usual, and um, uh, you will see, we will look into the study that was published in Lancet. So this is a very good journal. Uh, it is a, a premier European journal, kind of a similar to you would compare that probably to Journal of American Medical Association. And this is a large study. So what they did is it's a meta-analysis. So they, they took a variety of different randomized controlled trials to be exact. They analyzed 687 articles, and then they uh, uh, included 49 randomized controlled trials into the study. And they found that basically while esketamine in the beginning had a good benefit, in reality, after adjusting for all of the um, different possible variations, and also at the end, after a while, basically, esketamine was not effective. It had some benefits, but marginal versus the regular racemic ketamine, either as an IM or IV, remained effective for the entirety of all the studies. And, you know, this is interesting because, it, in essence, and oh, let me show you a little bit more detail. So if you're interested, you can come to this page. And of course, I will post the link to this actual article that you can download yourself at for free um, in the link of the, of the video. But if you look at it, they basically listed every single study in the trial. Uh, you can find how it was administered. So for example, this is the Berman 2000 study, single dose crossover with washout, meaning some patients get nothing or placebo, and uh, some people got the actual uh, drug, and then they crossed over. And this is the IV uh, ricemic at low dose, 0.5 milligram per kilogram. Um, so every study is recorded, and then they basically look at um, all of this composite. So the, the benefit of doing something like this in compared to uh, just looking at 
um, particular one study is that you have a lot larger pool of patients. And if you truly can compare the studies between themselves, then this is improves the statistical analysis and then it basically makes the, the data better. Uh, the problem is, can you truly compare, like we always joke, uh, meta-analysis is like comparing apples to oranges. And often it is true, but I think in case of this specific analysis, you actually can do this comparison because every study that was using esketamine was roughly the same. It was the same medication administered to roughly same, well, patient population would vary obviously from one location to another, depending where the study was done. But the, the actual um, assessments and actual trial details were very similar. And uh, the racemic ketamine in IM or IV were also relatively similar. We also do know that there is difference, a significant difference between administration of ketamine and intravenous versus IM, but we do think also in practice that results are often relatively similar. And the, I'm recently uh, thinking that IM is better, not necessarily because it actually works better, but I think because it's logistically a lot simpler to administer, it also works a lot faster. It's a bit shorter treatment, so it doesn't the effect doesn't last for last for more than say hour and a half. IV can last as long, but you have to continuously infuse it. So sometimes there is this issue of um, continuation of the effect a bit longer versus I am. It's a large dose immediately. Patients often have effect within minutes, if not seconds, and then you have a very quick up and a slow coming down, but it still ends up a little bit earlier than if you're doing a, say, an hour infusion or 45 minutes infusion, and then you have some after effect as well. So minor difference, but let's come back to the study. Uh, so I think in essence, uh, I, I, it validates what many of us in clinical practice have been seeing. I personally, we have, our practice have not done esketamine and we have no plans of doing esketamine. I, I feel in the many ways that um, it, we've, we've known that esketamine is just not as effective. And I don't think it's actually just because it's nasal versus in, in, injection. I think it's actually because racemic is better simply as that, but racemic cannot be patent since the medication has been around and is extremely cheap. So, so that's that. Um, let me add something to this topic since I'm kind of moving away from the study. I just want to give you a little bit broader uh, perspective here, um, sort of the, the general benefit of ketamine in compared to several other psychedelics. Uh, it's actually currently the only psychedelic that you can get completely legal in the clinic and still have a profound long-term effects or long-term benefits regardless of what you're trying to treat it with. So as I mentioned, the only FDA approved use of ketamine nasally as a spray is depression that has failed several other methods like different antidepressants, for example, and talk therapy. But if you're trying to use ketamine for other things, I mentioned chronic Lyme, I mentioned chronic fatigue syndrome, um, and actually lots of other conditions. It, it doesn't, uh, anything where um, taking away a suffering for a short period of time and putting patient in the different awareness state has a potential in identifying a direction of healing. The ketamine after, under appropriate guidance done correctly can be profoundly beneficial. Beneficial. We've seen this with some of our patients and, and many clinics report the same. Of course, the most uh, standardized use of in injection ketamine, particularly into infusion of ketamine has been shown to be very beneficial for a variety of different pain syndromes, chronic pain syndromes, specifically things like um, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, what used to be called RSD and now it's called, called chronic, um, uh, chronic uh, original pain syndrome. That's been shown for that to be very beneficial. Occasionally, we see it for other chronic symptoms, syndromes like a chronic neuropathic pain. Sometimes it can be a very significant breakthrough for some patients. So um, there's a lot of pain, pain centers that administer ketamine for pain. And of course, there's also a lot of psychiatrists that administer ketamine for pain, whether as an injection or as a, as a nasal. But um, whether or not this uh, very high quality meta-analysis is going to change the practice and will allow insurances to actually pay for... Uh, 
<laughs> in, injection, injections of regular low cost ketamine versus paying a pharmaceutical drug that costs, uh, what is it? Uh, four times eight, so roughly 3000 times more than um, the um, injectable should cost. You know, whether they're gonna allow for that cheap cost to be covered or not. Um, of course, you know, we don't charge patients 25 cents per treatment. You know, you have to charge a lot for not just, um, you know, not, not for the drug itself, but also for the time that the professional have to spend, which is at least two hours. Now, by the way, um, the cost of $800 that I mentioned, that's just the cost of ketamine. That is not the cost of psychiatrist time. So the psychiatrist would still bill insurance on top of that. Um, and so in essence, uh, if, if the most of the clinics, I think like ours, if they bill for a, a time on the the, the time for, for the clinician to administer, I think the actual bill for the injectable ketamine is gonna be significantly less than $800, I think, 100 to $200, maybe even less, depending on how much you charge for the practitioner's time, really. Uh, interesting fact, uh, about two years ago, I was approached by um, head of a DC Medicaid behavioral chain, behavioral program, and they were quite interested in working with us um, to cover that for the Medicaid population. And we were trying to discuss sort of the pricing and then COVID happened. So that kind of went on the, on hold, but I think this conversation probably gonna restart soon. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think with that very interesting topic, um, I, if anybody have questions about this, let me know. Uh, we can definitely revisit this. Uh, and of course, if you're interested in a, in a treatment modality and have questions, let us know. Um, on our website, we don't have a lot of discussion about ketamine. We do, we do it, we just restarted doing it um, and we will be offering it regularly to patients. We're also considering doing small groups. I think that's a very kind of a new way of doing some of the psychedelic treatments that it gained at a little deeper experience when you have a small group and you're not just sharing your personal experience with one therapist, but you're also doing it as a kind of a small retreat space, particularly, you know, you would do that on a weekend with a little bit of a prep and significant amount of work after. And that's actually something that I've personally recently did because I wanted to really deeply understand how that worked. And I, I worked with a very good mentor of mine um, on how to do this. Um, and I think it's essential that uh, there is a good understanding how it works, what it achieves and, and, and how you can help someone with a very careful prep before and after. And that's actually is critically essential that whatever the ketamine clinic you end up going to, to try this, that it's not just take the substance and leave after it's a lot of work goes in the prep and after. And also often it doesn't, it has to be more than one time. Um, in, in the trial, you'll see there are a variety of different settings. There were some places where it was just one treatment, but then there were some trials that were more than one. I think in general, uh, some people need more, more like three to five and a lot of people are gonna need many. Uh, and it's would kind of work for a while and then you have to come in to get a booster. Uh, there are ways of administering boosters after um, in sublingual way. So instead of buying this expensive medication, maybe that will be covered by insurance as a nasal spray. You can also get it from any compounding pharmacy with a physician prescription as a lozenge or some kind of a paste maybe or uh, uh, any, something that will dissolve under the tongue. It's not as effective as a shot, but it's definitely something that can be taken at home. Again, after you went through appropriate amount of counseling, coaching, and you understand how it works, of course. So, and, and of course it's not for everybody. It is not a recreational substance. If you're thinking of using this uh, for fun or for some kind of uh, personal getting high, that's just not what this is all about. It is a significant amount of in inner work that is required and you need to really be able to work with someone on this. Um, I think this is not something that can be done without appropriate coaching at least or better yet appropriate therapy uh, with a, with a well-trained 
uh, a therapist who's actually done training in this specific modality, not with just a general psychotherapy. So I hope that you find this video helpful. Please let me know uh, if you have any questions and uh, wish you well. And see you soon covering whatever the things are important and new and old and critical in the field of integrative medicine. Stay well.